In the Cypress Glades along the east coast of Florida, Philippe Cousteau heads a small expedition, which they hope will draw man's attention to the plight of an ancient animal, once held sacred by primitive men. In late autumn, Philippe and Jacques Delcouter await the arrival of the manatees, the mermaids of another time. Each season, the animals migrate south down the St. John's River to winter in this labyrinth of waterways, a natural haunt for a creature that evolved in the primordial swamp. Two hundred miles to the north in the St. John's River, the annual migration has begun. Millions of years ago, ancestors of the manatee walked on land, grazing in the prehistoric marshes. Through the ages, wandering ever deeper into the swamp in search of aquatic vegetation, they evolved into creatures of the sea. Other ancestors followed another path of evolution and became the manatee's closest living relative, the elephant. In its time, the manatee has been classified as fish, seal, whale, and finally as an order of its own, the Serenia. The manatee is not an animal of the open sea. He has perfectly adapted to living in shallow waters with near zero visibility. The signal which triggers their migration is the first cold breath of autumn, warning them that soon the river will turn cold. Ordinarily, the manatee exists in tropical waters. The Florida manatee survives this far north only because it can find winter refuge in warm springs. This year, as they move toward the warmth of Florida's blue springs, their travels may lead them out of centuries of obscurity into an area of man's awareness and concern. At Blue Springs, Captain Cousteau has arrived. Briefed by Philippe, his study of the manatee will begin long before the animals themselves appear. He will chart the St. John's River Basin and explore the animal's natural environment. Blue Springs, and on vous emmènera jusqu'au... Suivez-nous en l'air. On vous emmènera jusqu'à la source d'eau chaude. Okay. Back up. Philippe and his crew, who have been investigating the region by boat, will guide the helicopter in its aerial reconnaissance. Somewhere to the north, the manatees are continuing toward Blue Springs, swimming slowly against the current in the north flowing river. The St. Jones may be the world's only river with a resident population of manatees. Once they moved freely between the river and the sea, but now they're caught here, trapped by man-made congestion and pollution near the river's mouth. There are still isolated places where the river is bordered by green, unspoiled stretches of wilderness. Like a fading memory, they remind us of what this entire region once was like. The manatee travels on its stomach, slowly grazing southward. For this strict vegetarian, nicknamed the sea cow, the St. John's River is an endless pasture land, 
almost 300 miles long. The manatee has no cutting teeth. His lips envelop and tear the plant. His chewing teeth, regularly ground down from constant wear, are continually replaced. Without permanent teeth, there is no way to tell his age. Ranging along the river, Cousteau evaluates the natural world which has long sustained the manatee. Below me, everywhere, now lies shocking evidence that the manatee's world is rapidly shrinking. Not long ago, man came to the lush wilds of Florida and left behind monuments to his carelessness, a graveyard of rusting cars, grotesque tombstones for all the living things which flourished here. Symbols of arrogant power cast lengthening shadows on the wilderness. Chaotic development has already drained and destroyed much of the manatee's natural homeland. Returning to Blue Springs, Cousteau rendezvous with Philippe, who guides him along a narrow waterway toward the manatee's ultimate destination. for the migrating animals and for a growing number of winter vacationers is a tiny body of water, Blue Springs itself, where the temperature is a constant 74 degrees. Captain Cousteau has inspected more than 150 square miles of the manatee's domain. I have mapped the retreat of the Florida wilderness, the manatee's narrowing home. Because of the river's murkiness and pollution, we will concentrate our filming in the clear waters around Blue Springs. In late November, hordes of tourists converge on Blue Springs Park. The manatee's winter home, once an isolated refuge, has now become a popular resort. For campers, picnickers, boaters, amateur divers, at Blue Springs Park, it's summer and winter. And with the arrival of the manatees, there's additional sport. When in the clear blue water, man meets manatee. The swimmers are not deliberately malicious, but they have little understanding of this gentle animal who neither fights nor flees. He has nowhere to flee but back to the cold of the river. And with no natural enemies, he has virtually never learned to fight. The manatees have traveled the length of the St. John's River to find a little warmth and refuge. But the tiny channel, which has been their home for generations, is no longer theirs. Almost all the waterways in Florida have become speedways for a growing armada of pleasure boats. And the peaceful manatee's greatest single unnatural enemy has become a motorboat's propeller.
those not fatally wounded are mutilated and scarred. In man's race for excitement, the manatees have become unintentional victims. Because the victims descend quietly to the bottom with their attackers unaware, there is no public outcry, no sense of shame or guilt, no remorse at their fate. According to the narrow view of modern man, the manatee serves no useful purpose, feels no human need. He is a useless animal. We would try to get closer to these unloved, little-known creatures, to learn more about them ourselves. For only through understanding might they be rescued from man's ignorance and indifference. Does not the manatee, as much as any other creature, have a right to life? Cousteau's divers and the manatees have a rendezvous at dawn. Long before the tourists invade the quiet waters, they are the sole possessors of the morning. In the cold winter dawn, the warm waters of Blue Springs reflect another time, another world, unspoiled, in which for unnumbered centuries, the manatee thrived. This is the one time of day when we may find the manatees living undisturbed, as nature intended, unmolested by men and boats. As the manatees carefully inhale the warm air just above the surface, the divers envy them, anxious to get out of the cold and into the warmth of the water. Instead of conventional air tanks, they use their oxygen rebreathers, silent and bubble-free, in order not to alarm the animals. This will be the most extensive film study of a creature that has been an enigma since creation. Our divers approach the manatee in a silent, peaceful sanctuary where we feel like intruders. Here, life moves in accordance with the mood of nature, remote from the whim of man. To establish any meaningful relationship with these animals, shy as they are enormous, one must be patient. Some are in a state of sleep and only dimly aware of our presence. For six to ten hours every day, these great animals rest. When cruising, they surface for air about every two minutes. But when resting, the period may be more than doubled. Awake or asleep, they are an awesome sight. And in the peaceful quietude, they appear as figures in a dream. But they do exist, these little-known half-ton creatures, living on the very edge of our civilization. The manatee is a solitary creature. He has no strong social organization and no lasting relationships. The only real bond that exists is between a young calf and its mother.
The mother's breast is located where her flipper meets her body, which seems convenient for the calf, but conjures up visions of a very strange mermaid. The nursing of this young manatee has been the first ever recorded on film. The calf and its mother are inseparable for as long as two years until the calf is weaned. For now, they are content to rest in the warmth of the spring. But for the adults, there is little food here. And periodically, to survive, they must return to the river and to the cold. Cousteau's divers see an opportunity to gain the manatee's friendship. Less than two miles up the St. John's River, Soumillon enters a quiet backwater, choked with water hyacinth, a primary food of the manatees. Water hyacinth is considered a weed and a nuisance by pleasure boaters and real estate developers. But it holds the promise of a breakthrough in the relationship between the divers and the animals. It all depends upon whether or not the manatees accept the offering. Water hyacinth was first brought to eastern Florida less than a century ago. Imported from South America, it flourished here, and the manatee adapted to it as his native, less hardy vegetation disappeared. Without it, he would never have survived along the St. John's River. Philippe and his crew hope the offering of food will overcome the animal's natural timidity and attract him from turbid waters to an area of the clear spring where he can be observed and filmed without disturbance for hours at a time. In an isolated section of the channel, a feeding station is constructed. A rope stretched near the surface is secured with anchors and floats. This simple device will hold the water hyacinths in place and keep them from drifting with the current. The roped off area will become a man-made floating garden, an artificial pasture for the manatees. Animals will not be restrained by any physical barriers. They will be held by an even more powerful force, their insatiable appetite. the manatee's natural timidity is no match for his hunger. He spends six to eight hours of every day grazing happily among the water hyacinths. He is a floating appetite, 12 feet long. Taking a succulent hyacinth, Ximion will see if the manatees now have courage enough to accept food from his hand and in so doing, accept the man himself. The water hyacinth that began as a lure becomes a token of friendship. 
In time, these animals who have experienced only harassment at the hands of man come to know our divers and somehow to distinguish them from all others. Through the weeks of living with these animals, we become closer to them than any man ever have before. The very young are especially friendly, curious and trusting. They have not yet learned to fear. From the beginning, our only strategy has been patience. Now the manatees approach us directly with no qualm or fear. Their hesitant curiosity first led them to us. Now their unaccustomed trust binds them to us in a touching friendship. In mid-December, it is with profound reluctance that the men take leave of the manatees of Blue Springs. Filled with sympathy for these animals to a degree unexpected, they do not know how much longer the manatees can survive the relentless strangulation of their world and the total indifference of man. Now they leave Blue Springs to travel south drawn by the unusual and moving plight of a single animal, a manatee named Sewer Sam. February 1970, Miami, Florida. A 1,200-pound manatee, victim of the collision between civilization and the natural world, is extricated from a storm drain. The nine-foot animal had wandered out of the city's canals to become trapped in the 33-inch sewer. The newspapers would call him Sewer Sam, and he would always be identified by a distinctive scar between his eyes. Now he will be nursed back to health and put on display at the aquatic park, Sequarium. Crowds of people are drawn to Sequarium by attractions like the performing killer whales, animals who behave not as nature intended, but as man has made them. Not too far from the killer whale, there's a small tank with an animal who has learned no tricks, draws no applause, and few spectators. After a year, only his scar remains to mark Sewer Sam's one day of glory. Now he lives quietly in a 30-foot pool with two other manatees who have been here for more than a year. Each consumes something like 100 pounds of lettuce every day and with one male and one female already at Sequarium, Sewer Sam is one manatee too many. Sewer Sam's story is far from over. With Sequarium's cooperation, Captain Cousteau has conceived a plan to return him to freedom in the wild. In western Florida's Crystal River, the operation for Sam's deliverance begins. It is here, close to the wintering place of the manatees who inhabit the Gulf of Mexico, that Sewer Sam will be returned to his natural environment. In a small spring 50 yards across, Cousteau's men prepare for Sam's arrival. They build an observation platform, 
and close off the outlet to the spring. They will keep the manatee here during the first phase of a critical experiment to see if a captive animal can be returned to the wild. At Miami's aquarium, Sewer Sam's odyssey begins. Now the problem of dealing with the reluctance of a half-ton manatee to exchange a 10,000 gallon tank for a shipping crate. Some are born free, some achieve freedom, and some have freedom thrust upon them. The adventure which Sur Sam now begins will hopefully give him a chance to live his life as nature intended and provide us with scientific knowledge. But at this moment, my only concern is that he survive the rigorous handling necessary for his transfer to the wild. Thirteen months before, the people of Sequarium had rescued Sam from a sewer, nursed him to health, and given him a home. Now, they help send him off on his 600-mile journey to freedom. Away from the city, concrete and keepers, Sewer Sam is going home. Throughout the trip, Dr. Jess White is constantly at the manatee's side. He was there when he was rescued from the sewer and has cared for him ever since. From Miami, northwest across the state, it is two hours to Crystal River. 600 miles from where he earned his name, Sewer Sam is washed by the first promise of a wilderness home. Half a mile upriver is the little body of water that will become known to Cousteau and his crew as Sam Spring. It is tucked away in the midst of a small 40-acre wilderness, nature's last holdout here along the Crystal River. Through this woodland, they drag their half-ton load, maneuvering with difficulty along the narrow, twisting passageway to the spring. Surrounded here by nature, I become sharply aware of the awesome responsibility I have taken upon myself. We have moved a living, sensitive creature hundreds of miles to a territory where he has never been, where the water and vegetation are different from what he has known, and where even his own kind might reject him. In releasing this animal, we have gone beyond our knowledge beyond our power to predict what will happen. The final moment of Sewer Sam's long captivity is at hand. Easy. Liberation de Sewer Sam. Du moins tentative de libération. Here he goes. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, beautiful. 
Look at him. Look at him. Their first concern is whether the manatee will eat the unfamiliar vegetation here. The animal's immediate acceptance of the hydrilla weed growing on the bottom of this spring, when he has previously known only floating water hyacinth, marks the beginning of his readjustment to the wild. It is a simple act, but for the mermaid named Sam, it is a prologue to freedom. lifetime, this one animal has known freedom, the sewers of Miami, and life in a concrete tank. Now he gets to know the companionship of human divers who are with him constantly for two weeks, evaluating his progress, making sure that he is ready for release. In setting the manatee free, the one element over which the men will have no control is the threat of power boats. I've never seen one without the propeller start. Well, this one has them. Everyone I have, we have two, we have three, and two out of the three have propeller scars. But this one has. Joining the Cousteaus and Dr. White is Dr. Daniel Hartman, pioneer in manatee research. Some that I've seen that have hit maybe eight or nine times. You can see the, the old scars that yeah. have healed all over their back. So the only enemy they have are the propellers on the boat. And some. Spear fishermen, just for kicks. Spear fishermen. Just for mm. kicks. I've had three in the last year. Reports of some individual speared them for just for fun. Thank God. There was a man uh, that told me he lived here at Crystal River, that saw a manatee pass up a canal underneath the bridge that he was on with a garden rake embedded in its back. And then we a garden rake. Someone had taken a rake and just broken it on the animal's back, and the animal still had it embedded. Uh, we intend to put a pin on you. Do you have any idea of how we can we can actually attach something on such a smooth <coughs> animal? I was just talking to the Philippe, oh. and my suggestion would be to, to utilize those flippers. Yeah. In order to attach the pinger, a small sonar transmitter, the ever-hungry sewer Sam is lulled into a false sense of security by offerings of food. With a pinger attached, he can be followed to freedom. Now in a specially designed belt, the sonar transmitter. This device, which is activated by immersion, will provide the only way to track the manatee once he leaves the clear spring water. The only way Cousteau will ever know if Sewer Sam has found his way through the backwaters and canals into the open river. The transmitter belt, designed to wear off within a few days, is fashioned to fit around the manatee's flippers. have to find another way. Sewer Sam has vehemently rejected the flipper plan. The reluctant manatee in his own element is agile and powerful, capable of bursts of speed up to 25 miles an hour, more than a match for any diver. With a new belt designed to fit the manatee's tail, they will try again. Unless they can attach the pinger, they will have to turn him loose and watch him disappear into the murky water and never know his fate. In an eerie, echoing arena, man and animal confront each other. If in this unprecedented tournament, the man should fail, then both will lose.
The challenger's hopes lie in patience, luck, and perseverance. The manatee relies on 5,000 centuries of instinct. All Sewer Sam has ever known from these divers has been kindness. Now pursued, he is confused and seeks comfort in the weeds. Sewer Sam tries to flee, but the transmitter has been attached. Now the first barriers come down, and the countdown to freedom begins. For Sewer Sam, it's just another day among the weeds. After two weeks here, the manatee must be driven from the comfort of his spring. Young Buddy Powell of Crystal River helps them splash Sewer Sam out. As the manatee heads toward free and open water, he leaves behind a name belonging to captivity. Sam will never again be Sewer Sam. At the far end of the outlet, the final barrier is removed to the Crystal River, the final barrier between captivity and the world. In the river, Cousteau and his crew set up their sonar receiver to track the animal as he emerges. With their hydrophone, they will be able to pick up Sam's signals as much as two miles away. Now the last slender tie between Cousteau and the manatee will be a flickering acoustic signal. We have committed ourselves to follow the manatee until we have some indication of his destiny. But the venture begins badly. Sam, perhaps confused by the unfamiliar terrain, lingers somewhere in the outlet. We will take turns, waiting throughout the night. By the next morning, Sam has made little progress but still clings to the narrow inlets and canals along the river's edge and refuses to move out into open water. He's right in there. I, I suppose he's uh, feeding on the high thing. We have to wait for him. Sooner or later he'll go out. Is the signal clear? Yes, fairly clear. Right in. Right there. All day they wait. The signal's steady, but there's no sight of Sam. Sam has had his fill of hyacinth at last. This way. Yes, here. There he is. Sam is in the open water at last, but we must continue to follow him. We hope he will be able to resume the free and natural life of an animal in the wild. Philippe and Jacques Delcouter will continue to track him through the night. For more than 40 consecutive hours, Cousteau and his men have been working in eight-hour shifts tracking Sam. On the morning of the third day, Cousteau prepares to leave the little town of Crystal River to relieve Philippe and take his turn following the manatee. First, he must contact Philippe to find out where he is. 
Allô Philippe, allô Philippe, m'entends-tu Nous sommes prêts à partir, nous allons quitter Port Paradise. Nous allons quitter Port Paradise. Au revoir. Actuellement, nous sommes à Marina, c'est-à-dire la petite maison bleue. They are not far away, Philippe tells him. Two miles up the river in a wide open expanse of water. For Cousteau, the burning question is the manatee. What is Sam doing? Okay, qu'est-ce qu'il fait le manatee? Que fait Sam? En logique, ici Philippe, Sam a rejoint apparemment plusieurs autres animaux. Il tourne en rond. Sam has joined a group of other manatees. Philippe's discovery has exceeded our greatest hopes. First, Sam fed and thrived on natural vegetation. Then he regained the instincts of a free animal, and now he has been accepted by his mates. At least one wild creature has been returned to the world where he belongs. Since daylight, and the discovery that Sam was no longer alone, Philippe and Jacques Delcouter have been trying to take a census of the manatees. The only way they can determine their number is by counting their noses when they surface for air. Il est là! Il est là, il est là! Combien il y en a? Trois! Au moins trois! Of the total number, they can't be sure. Et il remonte! But Sam is with a group of three or more. Sam has found his, his friends. Now with his new friends, Sam departs, leaving old friends. Who wish him well. Somewhere, along with other manatees, Sam is swimming free. We can never say we gave him freedom. For freedom is not man's to give. Man can only take it away. When we released Sam from captivity, we merely returned to him what was already his by nature. propelled swamp buggy, harmless to the manatees, the Cousteau's father and son take a farewell tour of the manatees' natural home. It may also be a final look at one of the world's last remaining wilderness areas. The airboat which makes it possible to penetrate this marshland and to enjoy and study nature, may also be used by those who would destroy it. Poachers, hunters, men who come to kill. This little patch of wilderness should be cherished and protected. The villain is not technology, but those who abuse it, those who turn it against the wilderness and the precious wildlife it holds. For me, the mermaid myth lives. This is still Sirenia, the siren. Only her song has changed. Once, she lured men of the sea to their destruction. Now, she sounds a warning in a song of love.
swimming slowly against the current in the North Flowing River. The St. Jones may be the world's only river with a resident population of manatees. Once they moved freely between the river and the sea, but now they're caught here, trapped by man-made congestion and pollution near the river's mouth. There are still isolated places where the river is bordered by green, unspoiled stretches of wilderness. Like a fading memory, they remind us of what this entire region once was like. The manatee travels on its stomach, slowly grazing southward. For this strict vegetarian, nicknamed the sea cow, the St. John's River is an endless pasture land, almost 300 miles long. The manatee has no cutting teeth. His lips envelop and tear the plant. His chewing teeth, regularly ground down from constant wear, are continually replaced. Without permanent teeth, there is no way to tell his age. In the Cypress Glades along the east coast of Florida, Philippe Cousteau heads a small expedition, which they hope will draw man's attention to the plight of an ancient animal once held sacred by primitive men. In late autumn, Philippe and Jacques d'Alcouter await the arrival of the manatees, the mermaids of another time. Each season, the animals migrate south down the St. John's River to winter in this labyrinth of waterways, a natural haunt for a creature that evolved in the primordial swamp. Two hundred miles to the north in the St. John's River, the annual migration has begun. Millions of years ago, ancestors of the manatee walked on land, grazing in the prehistoric marshes. Through the ages, wandering ever deeper into the swamp in search of aquatic vegetation, they evolved into creatures of the sea. Other ancestors followed another path of evolution and became the manatee's closest living relative, the elephant. In its time, the manatee has been classified as fish, seal, whale, and finally as an order of its own, the Serenia. The manatee is not an animal of the open sea. He has perfectly adapted to living in shallow waters with near zero visibility. The signal which triggers their migration is the first cold breath of autumn, warning them that soon the river will turn cold. Ordinarily, the manatee exists in tropical waters. The Florida manatee survives this far north only because it can find winter refuge in warm springs. This year, as they move toward the warmth of Florida's blue springs, their travels may lead them out of centuries of obscurity into an area of man's awareness and concern. At Blue Springs, Captain Cousteau has arrived. Briefed by Philippe, his study of the manatee will begin long before the animals themselves appear. He will chart the St. John's River Basin and explore the animal's natural environment. Okay. Back up. 
Philippe and his crew, who have been investigating the region by boat, will guide the helicopter in its aerial reconnaissance. Somewhere to the north, the manatees are continuing toward Blue Springs. Captain Cousteau has inspected more than 150 square miles of the manatees' domain. I have mapped the retreat of the Florida wilderness, the manatees' narrowing home. Because of the river's murkiness and pollution, we will concentrate our filming in the clear waters around Blue Springs. In late November, hordes of tourists converge on Blue Springs Park. The Manatee's winter home, once an isolated refuge, has now become a popular resort. For campers, picnickers, boaters, amateur divers, at Blue Springs Park, it's summer and winter. And with the arrival of the manatees, there's additional sport. When in the clear blue water, man meets manatee. The swimmers are not deliberately malicious, but they have little understanding of this gentle animal who neither fights nor flees. He has nowhere to flee but back to the cold of the river. And with no natural enemies, he has virtually never learned to fight. Ranging along the river, Cousteau evaluates the natural world which has long sustained the manatee. Below me, everywhere, now lies shocking evidence that the manatee's world is rapidly shrinking. Not long ago, man came to the lush wilds of Florida and left behind monuments to his carelessness, a graveyard of rusting cars, grotesque tombstones for all the living things which flourished here. Symbols of arrogant power cast lengthening shadows on the wilderness. Chaotic development has already drained and destroyed much of the manatee's natural homeland. Returning to Blue Springs, Cousteau rendezvous with Philippe, who guides him along a narrow waterway toward the manatee's ultimate destination. for the migrating animals and for a growing number of winter vacationers is a tiny body of water, Blue Springs itself, where the temperature is a constant 74 degrees. 